Rodriguez, I'm from Ecuador. I send a big, a big huge for the big EFL community, teachers around the world. So um, I can see here some teachers from Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, and other countries. So everywhere you are, I will send my greetings, and that's a part of a contribution for the EFL uh, teacher development. So, um, well, we're excited today because we have a, a very interesting topic. We have our speaker, uh, Graciela Martinez. She's from Argentina. Um, Graciela, we already introduced her before, and we already talked about uh, uh, the presentation, the topic, and also important things now that Graciela will share with you. So I will um I will allow to that you can um that you can write in the in the chat. So you in, in case you need a uh, to require something, you need to ask a question or you need to interact about it, the topic. No, so Graciela, no, thanks for accepting this invitation, and I'm going to introduce you. No, introduce you right now. So. Officially, Gabriela, you are working in the university, no, in a, in Argentina, no. So you have um, you have some projects done for the EFL community, and uh -huh. teachers that's... training college, uh -huh. teachers exactly. training college, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that's one of your that's one of the activities that you are involved, Graciela, no. So yeah, um... one of many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. I can see that in the chat that you maybe are um sharing, no, sharing something about it. About teachers can um follow you and, and they can mm -hmm. ask you some questions. Okay. So Graciela, no, so in this moment I'm going to allow you to, to start. Okay. So I'm okay. going to fine. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. We are having more and more people coming in, and that makes me really very happy. Um, I can see some uh, faces of old friends, uh, former students, right? And that fills my heart and, and also meeting uh, this new audience. Um, I love interacting. I'm a teacher trainer, and that's what I do all the time. So don't be, uh, I mean, interact whenever you want, send a message. If it is something that you want me to answer at the moment, Andres will be telling me, right? If not, there will be questions and answers at the end. Um, at Teachers Training College, I, um, uh, I have, the, I teach the subjects of um, the fundamentals of, ELT of English language teaching and uh, learning. And I also teach um, a subject called um, this oral discourse practices for communication, right? So this presentation, in this presentation, I wanted to put uh, to put both things together. And well, this is what I'm going uh, to show you. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit of, about another project we have just started and I'd like you to join right so uh, I'm going to share out before um, get your smartphones ready because at the beginning I'm going to start asking you um, to contribute with some ideas right I want to get some some ideas from you right so if you have um, I don't know if you are used to Mentimeter, right? You can get to menti.com and uh, mentimeter.com and uh, we're, we're going to interact a little bit. So I'm going to start sharing my presentation and I'd like you to tell me if you can see it well. Just a minute. Yes, um, Graciela, in this yeah, all right. you're, you're yes. in the slides. So yeah. I'm going to start. I'm going to start. All right, just just a minute. It says sharing. Uh, it's taking a bit of a time. So just give me a sec. Come on. Doesn't want to start. <laughs> I want to set the big slide here. Give me a sec. Well, this is what always happens. If this doesn't happen, it's not a presentation. No. Come on. 
well, got sort of got stuck here. I want the big picture. Give me a sec. Mm -mm. Okay, wait. I'm going to stop sharing for the moment. I'm going to get it right here. Hmm. Oh, there. There it is. I hope I can do it now. All right. Why wouldn't it? It does at home. Oh, there. Oh, oof. Okay. Can you see the big slide? Yeah, I was going to see that. Oh, yes. Okay. So this is, the, <clears throat> this is the topic, pronunciation in the English language classroom. And thank you, World Language Academy, for this opportunity. Right. So let's start. Um, as I told you, my very beginning will uh, be a question to you, right? I, as a teacher trainer, I'm used to asking lots of questions because I love the contributions from my students. They know a lot. So I like that. And my question is, what do you teach in your English classes? What do you teach in your English classes? And think about it, what you teach when you plan your classes, right? Um, what items you, you always pay attention to when you want to design a lesson. And you can get into <clears throat> menti.com. You insert this code and you're going to find that you can contribute with four possibilities, right? And let us know. Meanwhile, I'm going to check here in, in my Mentimeter what's coming up when I get your contributions. And then I will be sure. Mm -hmm. Can you see this other slide now? What do you teach? Has come up. Right yes. Now. Okay. In a minute, it's coming up again. I have just refreshed it to see your answers. Could you get there? Could you insert the code? Okay. Seems the internet. Right. Okay, let's see if we get more here when we get the small picture. Okay, there we are. So we are getting some contributions already. All right, it's very dynamic. Okay. All right. So we get vocabulary, grammar, oh, protagonists there, sounds, habits, content, listening, more vocabulary, vocab, writing reading, listening, activities, learning techniques. Very interesting. All right, so see how, uh, yes, we agree on quite a number of things. Okay, great. Any other, any, just a few more seconds for you to participate here. All right, so as I was saying, you're giving me lots of input to continue with this, right? So the question, what do you teach in your English classes has been answered. And so here I'm going to give my contribution to that. So this is the menu for today, for today's presentation. As we said before, what is taught in the English language classroom? then we're going to see how pronunciation connects to other language areas in the English language classroom. How pronunciation connects and influences the four macro skills, right? Speaking, listening, reading, and writing. We will take a look at the impact of pronunciation 
I, I'll try to help some solutions. There's a question mark there. Those are probably my solutions, but I'm sure you will be able to give me suggestions. And at the end, I'm going to give you my own conclusion and there will be time for you to share your thoughts. So um, we saw that uh, in, in the Menti, grammar and vocabulary were probably the center of um, what we teach, right? But my point is that pronunciation is linked to all those items that you, uh, that you shared in the Menti, right? Pronunciation has to do with grammar, as you pointed out, grammar there, vocabulary, notions and functions, skills, and everything else that appeared in that word cloud, right? I didn't include them, but in notions and functions, culture, um, uh, strategies, everything has to do with pronunciation with one very important goal, which is communication, because that's what we want to do with the English, with the language we learn. So more questions now. I said I was a question maker. And uh, this is for you to think, and you can write your answers in the chat if you want. How often do teachers teach pronunciation? Uh, I'm not thinking of um, I'm not thinking of phonetics and phonology, but pronunciation. How often do we take time to think of pronunciation to teach pronunciation? How much time is devoted to the teaching of pronunciation? How much emphasis? is made on correct pronunciation. And how important is correct pronunciations to teachers and students? I'm asking this because sometimes we teachers consider that pronunciation is very important and students perhaps don't, or they just don't care about it. They just want to communicate. So let's explore what happens with incorrect pronunciation as regards everything else we've seen before. I got, um, in 2020, I interviewed uh, Professor Robin Walker. I don't know if you are acquainted with him, but he's an expert on pronunciation. And we talked about this article, Pronunciation Matters. Professor Robin Walkers is uh, British. He's from the north of England. I can't remember the city in particular, but he uh, worked and has worked in Spain teaching English to Spanish speakers for more than 30 years. And feeding from that experience, he wrote this article, which I highly recommend. Um, and he speaks about pronunciation and how it matters all the matters of pronunciation. You can read it both ways. You can interpret it in both ways. So most of my talk is based on this, plus my own experience as a pronunciation teacher. So we're going to see how incorrect pronunciation influences and sometimes very often affects speaking, listening. This is pretty obvious but also reading and writing. So let's start with pronunciation and speaking, right? The main goal for, for us to speak English is to encourage our learners to be clear and to be intelligible when they speak. This has nothing to do with acquiring a perfect accent, right? Or acquiring a British accent or an American accent. We all have our own accents. We're all, we are Spanish speakers. Uh, Natalia from Ukraine, she's, she's got 
uh, another accent, probably we all speak English, but we want to make ourselves clear and intelligible and intelligible when we speak. So there is there is obvious impact of pronunciation on this skill. And poor pronunciation will affect and will cause different kinds of um, problems or issues. Poor pronunciation will affect fluency because if a speaker is not sure about the way some word or some phrases are pronounced, fluency will be affected and that will affect interaction. If we are interacted, interacting with another English speaker uh, person, right? And because of our poor pronunciation, the messages do not come across. Uh, we cannot transmit the message or hear, um, understand a message. Interaction gets poor. And the speaker loses confidence. If the speaker cannot be understood, well, they start becoming less and less confident. And it has to do with the use of vocabulary. Probably the speaker will try to use those words they are, they are sure about, those words they know they can pro uh, pronounce properly and the vocabulary will become limited. It's, I brought two examples. I took these examples from my context but you can uh, definitely contribute with others. Let's take these two words, the first one, right? And we see how pronunciation affects vocabulary. We know the pronunciation of the first word is comfortable, comfortable, but I have heard other pronunciations like comfortable, comfortable. And I have also heard another pronunciation because the last two syllables in this uh, word resemble another word in English. So some students of mine have come up with something like comfortable. Comfortable. Has it happened to you? Have you had that kind of thing? Yes, have you? Oh, somebody from Georgia. Right. Yes, Miss Belen says, She's come up with, with this uh, situations, right? And what about the next one? Vegetables, vegetables. If we are Spanish speakers, sorry, I'm, I'm focusing on this. I, I apologize to uh, all members in the audience uh, who are speakers of other languages. But for us, Sp Spanish speakers, if we look at this word, we may say one, two, three, four syllables, right? Because in our mind, we use syllable chunking uh, the same as for Spanish, but actually it's got three syllables in English, vegetables, vegetables. And then we may get pronunciation, pronunciations such as vegetables or even vegetables, right? And obviously these, these wrong pronunciations will impact on intelligibility. When we are speaking, there is an interlocutor. And if we don't share the same sound codes, as I said before, interaction will be affected. Let's talk a bit now about grammar. This, if you remember the word cloud, these were the, you said it, these were the two main um, fields in our teaching lessons. So what about grammar? I have just included these few, but there are loads of examples. First, I am, I am. Well, we teachers tend to teach I am and we teach the other forms of the verb to be. But for fluent speech, we need to teach I'm, I'm. If students or uh, learners are not acquainted with these short forms, with these contractions, they will probably pronounce the full forms, which are okay for writing, but which are quite odd for speaking. The same happens with can and can't. They might be tempted to stress these words when they are speaking, even if it's not necessary because they want to make the difference. But what happens is that 
Well, we need to tell them that there are two different vowel sounds, can, can't, and we don't need, we don't even need to teach the ta. Mm -hmm. That sound may, may very well be uh, forgotten, elided, right? And then conditional sequences, all the conditional sequences you can think of. I'm going to think, I'm going to uh, take as an example, the last conditional, the third conditional, this terrible structure for our learners would have or would have been, would have been, would have gone, I'd have been, I'd have gone, I'd have brought, right? If we teach our learners, when we teach grammar, we want to teach them all the components of the structure. But we need to also need to tell them that in spoken English, we are not going to separate and pronounce every single word in isolation, but we need to link all the words, use short forms and um, weak forms and pronounce, I'd have gone, I'd have brought, I'd have been. So if I, for instance, if I'd accepted your invitation, I'd have gone to your party, right? If I had accepted, I would have gone. Perfect for writing, but not that suitable for speaking. So in that case, fluency will be affected as well as perhaps interaction. So this is what I have seen that teachers usually do when they have these problems with speaking, when they, when they find that their students have these speaking problems, they give learners more practice on vocabulary, probably practice, uh, practicing words in isolation, right? A list of words to repeat, repeat after me, which is okay, fine at the beginning, but we need to move one step forward, right? And they include more grammar activities in their classes and in their homework so that learners start becoming more and more confident with the grammar. If we remain there, we are halfway. We need to go further and we need to work the same things but linked to pronunciation practice. So will this solve the pronunciation problem? Mm, I don't think so. It will probably solve vocabulary problems, grammar situations, grammar issues, but not the pronunciation problem. Perhaps this may be a short-term solution. In class, somebody repeats, uh, says a word with a wrong, using a wrong pronunciation. We ask them to say it again after our own model. Okay, problem solved at that moment. But are we fostering learners' autonomy? Are we helping them to become autonomous when they come out of our classroom? They will not always be our own learners, our own students. They will want to come into the world to use their English for communication. Remember the first slide. So here's a possible solution I'm, I'm uh, suggesting, but there may be many others. Then we can discuss this. We need to offer help with pronunciation of contractions, of weak and strong forms. Depending on the level, it may not be necessary to say that's a weak form, that's strong form, but we might help them pronounce can, can, I can go, can, can, just can. Uh, yes, you can do it. Yes, you can, you can do it. Weak, very weak form. Linking. I'd have gone, I'd have been, right? And word stress, comfortable and not comfortable. And when we teach them about word stress and they become aware, they say, ah, that's it. We are also solving a sound problem because if we, put the, if we place the stress at the beginning, first syllable in comfortable, comfort, comfortable, we get a weak sound in the second or no sound, just the, 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 um, the consonant sound. Now, if we move the stress to the second syllable, or if our students move the stress to the second syllable, they will go for comfortable, 
And instead of no vowel, they will insert a strong vowel there, a full vowel O, right? So word stress is crucial when teaching pronunciation. So when we teach a word, my suggestion to everybody, to my teacher trainers, uh, sorry, to my teacher trainees is teach the word, teach the meaning, teach context where you can use those words, but also teach how to pronounce it and how to stress it. It's part of the identity of the word. With the little ones, we can highlight, we can use colors, we can use comfortable, right? Vegetables, we can clap, we can jump. With older students or in other levels, we can have different techniques they can write and, and perhaps at teacher's training college, they can also write the pronunciation in um, with symbols. Okay, are we all right? Are we fine so far? Yeah, just give me a thumb up if you want. Right, so let's go with, uh, let me see, I've got something in the chat. Oh. All right, uh, fine. Pronunciation and listening. So remember, we had speaking, now listening. Obviously, if we're interacting, one at, at some moment one is speaking, the other is listening, and then we change roles, right? So what happens with this? Again, impact is obvious. If there is some wrong pronunciation, the listener may misunderstand words or phrases, right? And I have brought, and obviously we'll misunderstand the message. I have brought some examples here. Some of them are very funny and some of them I've taken from my own students and my own classes. What about hat and hot? Or what about heart and hurt, right? For example, we may say, oh, you made my heart hurt. That makes my heart hurt hurt. Totally understandable, perfectly understandable. What about that? That makes my hurt heart. My hurt heart. Mm. Sad? What did you say? Now, next one is one of my favorites. Message and massage. What about these two sentences? Uh, these two messages. If somebody tells you, uh, you soon get a message from, uh, from my brother you'll soon get a message from my brother. You'll soon get a massage from my brother. Oh my God, things have changed, haven't they? So problems of pronunciation, when somebody says something wrong and we hear that, so we process the message. We are, we are the interlocutor, the listener does not understand that the other one has made a pronunciation mistake. The interlocutor in a communicative situation, right, understands the message as it comes. And this course and curse, this I have taken from teacher's training, course and curse, you know, you teach a course. But sometimes my students, I have heard students saying, oh, I love this curse, meaning I love this course. I understand that sometimes my courses may be a curse to students, but that's another story. So let's be careful because here we may be given a totally, totally different, um, uh, different message. All right. And so because of these and other uh, wrong pronunciations, there may be partial or complete lack of understanding. So there may also be wrong meaning because of not recognizing the nucleus, not recognizing the most important word in the message. Let's suppose we have this situation. My husband and I receive an invitation uh, to go somewhere for dinner. And we have to confirm that invitation. So I phoned my the host who has invited or hostess who has invited me. And I say, okay, uh, yes, I'm going. Yes, I, I'll be going, I'll be going. 
All right, fine. Probably the host understands that both of us will be going. But what if I say, yes, I'll be going. I'll be going. That implies that I myself will be going, uh, but my host cannot count on my husband. For some reason, my husband won't be there, right? So helping students recognize where the most important word in the message is, is helping them to communicate efficiently. And this, now then we're going to see that this also helps them with listening pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, listening uh, comprehension. I was thinking of pronunciation, listening comprehension. So this listening, uh, this impact may be low on micro listening lessons, right? If we, in class, if we make them listen uh, to very short things, all right, very short, um, very finely tuned, especially for their level of English, right? So that, that may not be so, com so problematic, but it may have higher impact on extended listening. Let's suppose there is a listening comprehension activity in which there is a passage. We, play, we start with a whole pre-listening activities, et cetera, and then they have to listen to the passage in order to do some tasks, right? If they don't get, if, they, if their brain does not process what they are listening to, what they can hear, they won't be able to perform the tasks efficiently later because they may hear differently. When they put together the input they receive with what they, the pronunciation they have stored in their minds, and there is a clash between those two things, that will not help them in their activities for listening comprehension. So, what do teachers usually do? Well, if there are problems with listening uh, comprehension, I have heard teachers say, oh, you've got to do more listening. Listen to everything, listen, listen, listen. Okay, but the same problem, the same underlying problem may go on. Is this the best solution? How about finding new strategies and even creating our new strategies? Somebody spoke about teaching strategies uh, in the wrote in the uh, word cloud. So possible solution is to help learners notice and we should raise their awareness. They, look, pay attention to that. That's important, right? We need to help learners perceive the weak and the strong forms, the elision of sounds. Say, but what did they say? I can't understand. Okay, because in fast speaking, in fast speech, in um, informal speech, we do away with a number of sounds which are not important for the, the content of the message. And also when some words come together in clusters, right? When we elide, we get phrases that the sounds get together and then they're, they're not just one single words, one single word, they are quite a number all together. We need to raise aware of assimilation, right? Assimilation, how one word connects to the next by changing a sound. They say, oh, I can't understand, right? Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> that book, that book, that, that book is a that book why that what is that that well it's the assimilation to that book linking how one word links to the other speaking in chunks right meaningful chunks that the mind can process and understand and as i said before helping them distinguish which word in the message is the most important because that will definitely help them uh, to understand the whole message. Okay, so far so good, are we happy? Yeah, all right. 
let's pass on to pronunciation and writing. All right. For us, English, uh, Spanish speakers, and I'm speaking from my stand again, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between the letters we read and the sounds, right? But that doesn't, unfortunately, does not happen in English, right? The impact may be less obvious than in speaking and listening because we say, okay, when do I perceive pronunciation the most? Okay, when we are speaking and when we are listening. But in writing, as I said before, when we're talking about English, there is little or no connection between spelling and the sounds in words. And let me move this. Right. Um, students, learners may come up with invented spellings, right? With spellings uh, of uh, non existing words, just because in the Rinta language, um, they, um, in, sorry, I want to change this. Give me a sec. But you can see this better. In their, inter, in their own interlanguage, they get um, they get some sounds for a word, and they represent that in their own word with the letters they have at hand. And so some spelling. They say, but where did you come with this? Did you come up with this from? Right? And they may get some words spelled in various, the same word spelled in various different ways, right? And maybe we are checking, we are marking or assessing some written passage and we find the same word two or three times written differently, right? Some common examples that come to my mind now, what about these two pairs, writing and written? One T double T, right? They come up and go, they come and go from writing and written with one T and double T very often. And like that, many others, right? Uh, I'm thinking of uh, throw through the past tense of throw, um, through the preposition thought, though, Sarah. Okay, my God, that's a nightmare, right? But it happens that some invented spellings may turn out to be real words with different meanings. And so there we are, uh, we, we've got an issue, right? Because if they insert a different spelling, which has a different meaning, and that means something else, the message will definitely be different. What do teachers usually do? Okay, let's have a dictation, right? These are the words that, uh, in which you have had problems. Let's have a dictation in all its different fashions, right? Different ways, the traditional dictation, the dictogloss, right? Something probably uh, more dynamic, right? Dictations on the board, dictations for marking, but dictations, right? Yeah. Uh, good old dictations. If there are too many spelling mistakes, teachers may ask learners to rewrite their productions, believing that they will be paying attention. And what they will do is just copy again because they want to just finish with that, to, with that task and give it back to you so that you teacher feel very happy. But most probably, they won't internalize what you as a teacher want them to internalize. Uh, we, make, uh, we may ask them or we ourselves can make posters with list of mis misspelled words. That's not, that's not a bad thing, that's good. I've had them in my, in my uh, classrooms, right? But actually they do not solve um, the whole problem. They help, they help in a short time. So will this solve the problem of pronun learner's pronunciation problem where we are, right? Possible solution. 
offer learners some tips on spelling and pronunciation. I spoke about writing and written. So they may say, oh, I can't remember which one goes with one T, which one with double T. Okay, something very simple. If there is one T, you will pronounce the, the, the previous sound as how the letter sounds in English. So the previous sound is letter I, the, the previous letter is letter I. So it, with only one T, it will be pronounced writing. With a double, it will not, that will not happen. So writing, written, there will not be a diphthong there, right? There will be only just one vowel sound, not two. And the same applies to others, later, latter, right? And you can think of uh, many, many others, right? And you can work with your students and they will probably come up with some examples. We can design a pronunciation lesson on significant words for the writing task that we are going to, that our learners will have to perform. Remember that this is pronunciation and writing. So we want them to write about, we've been working on a lesson on a certain topic and we want them to write about something. Let's take a simple topic, our favorite animal, description, etc. right? So, uh, okay, what can we say about our favorite animal? We start brainstorming words, right? And we write those words on the board. And we pay attention, we ask them to pay attention to the spelling. And we work on some pronunciation problems that may be linked to spelling there before they have to do their writing, right? So it's not just brainstorming for vocabulary. It's brainstorming for vocabulary and their pronunciation and how that right or wrong pronunciation will influence the writing task they will have to do later, right? So most probably, I believe that most, and, and I think, I strongly believe that most probably, those students will get fewer mistakes in the writing if we go with this, right? If we go with this. All right, so. And this I love, which is let's bring out our learners' inner voice before they write or they edit. What is the inner voice? That's, I call it the, uh, well, we call it the, the voice they have in their minds and the voice that pronounces the words for them. When they are going to write, the words are first phonologically represented in their minds, even if they are not saying it. There is a little voice saying it up here, right? So when through brainstorming, we bring out their, their inner voice, right? We, they can hear themselves out loud and they can write what they hear. And there we can check and help them, and if we go back in some slides, help them become aware of uh, problems, right? Before they actually do their writing task. Right, let's see, oh, time. Pronunciation and reading. Let's go with this, also very important. Well, we know that reading is one of the best sources of input. When we read, we process a text. And what we read first comes to, into our shorter memory. And then we store the new words and phrases that we get from that input, from that reading. And that goes to our long-term memory, right? Now, in between this moving from short-term memory to long-term memory, there is subvocalization of new words and phrases. I'm going to explain it in the new slide. Subvocalization, right? And that is 
conscious or unconscious repetition of the words in our in our minds in our heads some people write to read aloud but others read in silence however there is this inner voice repeating what they are reading in our in their minds and here we come to the phonological loop right which is quite important right when we get i'm um, here when we get speech input input from listening right we store the message and the words in our short-term memory where we sub-vocalize the, the, the voice, the inner voice in our minds repeats this over and over again in a loop. And then eventually the sounds are stored in the long-term memory. The words are stored in the long-term memory. The same happens with non-speech inputs, which is reading, right? We read, there is a little voice pronouncing, right? Sometimes in the right way, sometimes in the wrong way. There is this loop. And then at some moment, those words get stored. Now, if they are stored with a wrong pronunciation, right? If they are stored with a wrong pronunciation, they will, remember that in that way forever and then we will have the impact on speaking listening and writing okay this is the phonological loop is very very interesting to to, to read about consequences during the phonological loop the word may be lost and never stored well because we don't remember it's a word that we don't use very often okay let it go but new words may be stored with a wrong or a changing pronunciation. And here comes this throw through, thought, though, Sara, or oh, miss, I can't remember how, or oh, oh, sir, I can't remember how to, to spell this. Can you help me? I never remember it. I never remember it. Okay, this is because the words are still going around in this loop and they haven't been stored properly, right? So, Deeper consequences for pronunciation and reader. Learners can't make connections between words in their long-term memory. They read the words, but they don't have the actual connection in their minds. So they may forget what they are reading. They have a short attention span because they cannot connect those words to what they have in their mind. And very often they need to go back to the beginning of the text and start again. And so we get these very slow readers, right? And for them themselves, it's, it's a problem, right? Because they cannot get to the end of the passage when perhaps the whole class has already finished. Oh, there, there's a mic, uh, which is... Yes. And there's often, yes, if we can... Turn it off, uh, Andres. Probably you can do it for me. Let me see. Yeah. It's okay, Graciela. Can you hear? Can you can you hear me now? I already changed the configuration. Uh, you just change your your account. Uh, Graciela, I think you're on mute. We're not hearing you. Could you please turn your phone, please? We can. Oh, hear sorry, you. sorry, 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 sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know why it happened. I tried to mute somebody and I muted myself. All right. So, um, learners need to go back to the beginning of the text and start again, and they they lose track of what they are reading, right? And sometimes, very often, there is little notion of where to chunk what they are reading and where to place the nucleus. We go back to the beginning. And I have found uh, learners reading in lines. So
So they stop at the end of the line, even if that's not the end of the message. And then they start again and stop at the end of the line and they start again. There is little notion of what to do with the punctuation in writing and how to connect it to chunking in, in reading. Okay, so what teachers, what do teachers usually do? Again, before we said do more listening and here do more reading, extensive reading, reading for pleasure, read aloud. But if we leave the learner alone, they will keep on having the same problems. Is this effective? Is it a long lasting solution? Hmm. Not long lasting, maybe effective for the classroom, for the moment in which we are teaching that. But what happens when they come out? What happens when they go to the real world and they have to read something really important and that will probably have to do with their everyday situations or, or things they, they have to, to solve? So possible solution, teach learners some phonological aspects such as sound recognition, stress patterns, dictation of sentences with Let's use dictation of sentences with confusable words. Let's give them some basic notions of tonality and tonicity, right? Like, okay, organize what you have to say, what you want to say. Organize it in short bits, right? And think about what's the main word there. So give emphasis to that main word. Right, preparing presentations uh, is a good, uh, asking them to talk about something they like is a good activity. And something which I particularly use is shadow reading lessons, which is a combination of, if you haven't, if you're not uh, acquainted with this, a combination of reading and listening. We give our learners the same text for reading that as the one they're going to listen to. So we ask them to listen first and then, okay, now you will read at the same time you hear this. So following the speaker in the listener, right? in the listening. So that will help them see where the speaker pauses, where the speaker makes emphasis, where they have to stop, right? And et cetera, et cetera shadow reading we can start with short bits and then we can get with uh, longer uh, sentences paragraphs etc all right conclusion i think i have i have tried to make my point that pronunciation is at the center of everything it's not just another aspect of language it's the core of language it's at the heart of language. Pronunciation, as I say, it's at the heart of what we do in the language classroom. And good pronunciation is very important to make progress in other areas of language, right? If we want our learners to keep making progress, we cannot neglect the teaching of pronunciation. When I say good pronunciation, again, I repeat, I'm not meaning, I don't mean um, perfect an accent, get, get a British accent, get an Australian accent, get an American accent. If you don't have it, your pronunciation is not good. No, what I mean is intelligible, comprehensible, internationally useful pronunciation. Now, competence in the four skills is closely related to competence in pronunciation, right? This is my point, and this is what you can read in Robin Walker's article. Some suggestions for teachers. Don't be afraid of teaching pronunciation. No, there's nothing all about it. Integrate pronunciation to your classes or into your classes. Design your own pronunciation tasks or lessons according to the goals and needs of your learners. We may get wonderful books, right, with lots of activities, but what 
we may use them, of course, because there have been people working on them very thoughtfully, but let's just take, let's take those, let, let's pick those that fit our learners' goals and our learners' needs, right? Show your students that pronunciation matters because we teachers, we, we may be willing to accept some wrong pronunciation. Well, because we're in the classroom, yes, I understand you. But that is our micro context. When, we are, when they come out into the world, they will be alone. We need to make them autonomous, right? The teacher won't be there. Teach pronunciation for intelligibility and foster autonomous learning, right? Give them tools, give them strategies to keep learning and to keep improving their pronunciation. And something I mentioned before, and I want to make a, a big point of this, don't worry about not having a perfect accent. We all have our, our own accent, which is influenced by our mother tongue, so uh, my accent is probably River Plate Argentinian accent, right? And you will have your Ecuadorian accent, Peruvian accent, Ukrainian accent. It's our own identity, but we want to be intelligible. And here, non-nest, this na 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 est, right? Non-native English speaking teachers, I think there is not an English. Is, is there anybody here who's a native speaker of English? A native speaker of, a teacher of English. Most of us or all of us are non-native English speaking teachers, right? English is not our first uh, language. I've got somebody in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, English is not our first language. And we stand in a very good position when teaching pronunciation, why? Because we can tell our learners, look, do this, I suggest you do this, I suggest you do that. When I was a student, I had exactly the same problems you're having now, but I did this and it worked for me. And we are good models to them, right? So we can say, and we can anticipate or, or discover or, or know why they are making that mistake. Ah, because it comes from Spanish. Ah, because it comes from Ukrainian, right? And that's why they have this, this, this problem. Mm -hmm. And so we can give them tools to solve it. So we non-native English speaking teachers have a strong saying in the teaching of pronunciation to our own learners. All right. Here are references I'm very happy to share with you if you write to me. And well, thank you, Ecuador, for uh, hosting uh, this presentation. There you've got uh, ways to get in touch with me. I will be very happy to answer your emails. Uh, if, you, if you write to me, that's my email, Facebook and LinkedIn account. And this Teachers in Action is. Um, our, my and our um, recent project on Instagram. It's an account for teachers, for teachers support, for teachers professional development. Uh, we have started small, we hope we can grow. And uh, you, if you get there, I ask you to follow us. Uh, there will soon be lots of, of new things. Um, I'm not alone, you will see me there, but I'm not alone. This project is me and a group of former students of mine at Teachers Training College, now my colleagues, they have graduated and they have uh, taken, um, they, they have uh, taken other courses uh, on, on pronunciation, on uh, ELT techniques and on, uh, teaching for diversity, right? Teaching for students with different educational needs and quite a number of things. We're all working in a big think tank to support teachers and their uh, professional development. So 
I uh, hope you can join us. And thank you, World Language Academy. Thank you, the audience, right, for this, um, for this opportunity to share time with you. I'm open to questions, to contributions. Hope you liked it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Graciela. Um, well, I was reading some of the messages here in the chat. Okay, most of the teachers were uh, texting their email because we're going to send them more information. Okay. Um, in this moment, teachers, if you have some questions about this topic, uh, you can ask to, to Graciela. You can you can put up your hand if you want to open the mic right there. Yes. I can't I can't hear very well. Yeah, dear teachers, don't be afraid of asking. So it, it's I have a, a question. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Gonzalo. Uh, Hello, Gonzalo. Jury speaking sessions. Uh, how do you? How do you correct your students' pronunciation, like when you when they are speaking? Mm, I've got some students here, uh, Rocio, Belen. I can see them smiling there. So I I cannot lie. I have to tell the truth. All right. Well, it depends, Gonzalo. Uh, we we've got to see whether we are teaching for fluency or whether we are teaching for accuracy. Right. If, uh, for example, in, the, in one of the subjects I teach, which is um, phonetics and phonology, I've got to teach for accuracy. So in that case, I'm quite strict at, uh, at them, right? Though I, want, uh, though I prefer that they become aware of their own uh, pronunciation rather than being prescriptive, I like them to think of what's going on. There is something called uh, proprioception, which is understanding how your vocal organs work and how they, how you need to make them work in order to produce certain sounds. So I start us from there, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I need to be a little, a little bit stricter than when we are working for fluency, for example, in the other in the other subject I teach, which is the fundamentals of English language teaching and learning, uh, if I'm asking for contributions, what do you think about this? And they are giving their opinion. I will never ever stop them. I will never ever stop them to correct a sound. If I don't get it. Uh, correctly, if I don't get the message correctly, I may come up with a question such as, sorry, so let me see if I understood correctly. What you mean is that, but I'm not going to stop somebody who is trying to give me their opinion to say, hey, you've said that wrong. Why? Because that person will never dare to speak again in class if I yeah, you know, this question of the affective filter, crushing and the affective filter. No, let's lower it. Let's lower it. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have answered your question, Gonzalo. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. That was very interesting, Graciela. Thanks, Gonzalo. Thanks for asking that interesting question. Um, let me read in the chat, please. Uh, yes. Matilde. Matilde has a question. What would be the first step when a teacher is afraid of her own speaking skills? Graciela? Uh, <laughs> okay. First off, I would say, again, awareness. Awareness. Discovering what's going on with your... Uh, with your um, speaking skills, right? If the teacher is afraid of that, the teacher should sort of do some kind of introspection. What's wrong? Is it that I'm afraid of pronouncing words in the wrong way? Or is it that I'm afraid of interacting? Am I very shy? Should I work more on my Inter interpersonal um, skills before, that is communicating with others. Should I work on that? Because perhaps it's not a problem of pronunciation, it's a problem of relating to the others of the interaction process, right? 
And then, of course, if, it's, if, the, if that teacher finds out or, or is aware that there are sounds to correct, well, there are always uh, lots of um, material on the web with uh, interesting activities to follow. There are pronunciation coaches who do work on that, on those fields, right? And if there are very specific things that they can be um, dealt with in a in a one to one session, right? As uh, when when actors train their accents for different films, right? So it's vocal training also, right? But I would say that the first step, because that was your question, the first step is getting into our own, uh, let's say, mind and thinking, where is the weak point? And where is the weakest point, right? And start working there, right? Because some people, I've got students that say, uh, I don't want to participate because I'm very shy. And then when I give them the chance to record themselves at home, saying something, giving their opinion, right? And they are not in front of an audience. They surprised me with the high quality of their sounds and with the high quality of their speech. So sounds was not their problem, were not their problem. It was not sounds. It was shyness and it was probably speaking in front of an audience, right? So first step, detect where the weak point is, I think. Okay, Matilda. Okay, yes, I agree with you. Um, um, when people feel embarrassed, now it yeah. stops and blocks them to for speaking. So, and we have been uh, surprised now when we see that in front of the public they start uh, uh, speaking and they sound correctly. Yeah, Graciela. Yes, definitely, definitely. This has to do with, and obviously, then remember that we teachers. Um, Sort of, we're sort of actors on a stage, right? So, well, let's 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 be let's be actors, actresses. Let's enjoy what we are doing. Let's play with sounds, and let's give us permission to make mistakes. Let's give us permission to make mistakes, right? We will always make a mistake, and that's okay because then we have the, the opportunity to learn from what is wrong, right? We can all make mistakes. And if we don't know a pronunciation that our students ask us, Miss, how do, Miss, uh, how do you pronounce this? In, instead of inventing something that may be wrong, let's, let's go together to the dictionary. Now we've got our smartphones. We can even get the pronunciation. In the past, we had to read the pronunciation, right? But now we can get the sounds, right? We just click. Uh, on on the sound and we get it and we get the British version, the American, the Australian, we get lots of versions. Let me give you here in the chat, let me suggest a wonderful tool. Youglish.com. You want to know how a word is pronounced or how a phrase is pronounced. You get into Googlish. You need to set whether uh, you, you need to choose whether you want American, British, whatever. There are four or five uh, options. And um, what do you get when you click? Huh? You write the word, the phrase, you click, and you get thousands, thousands, literally, of bits from YouTube videos, from films, from uh, lectures, from uh, TED Talks, right? where that word or that phrase is being pronounced. So you hear different people pronouncing that. You hear how young people pronounce it, how old people pronounce it, how they pronounce it in a conversation-like situation, how they pronounce it in a, in a more formal situation, right? And you hear it, you've got this powerful input of uh, the listening material. Youglish, highly recommended, created by Professor Jeff Lindsay. It was much harder, but we were pushed to look for more, uh, pushed to look for information about it. Yeah, I, uh-huh. 
Yes. Okay. Yes, it was much harder in the past. Okay. Thank okay, you, Maria, teachers, like, would you like to say something, any reflection about this uh, uh, at the end of this topic? So, well, Graciela, I will say something about this presentation. I think that was wonderful. And topics related to linguistics or related to pronunciation, I think they are beneficial because most of the time in the core subjects and the content subjects at school or universities, we sometimes we don't stop teaching them. So because that's an evidence that we have some more um, the curriculum topics that we have to develop in our curriculums. And, and sometimes pronunciation is, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, to say that it's separated, but we don't uh, correlate. We don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, prioritize it. But today I think it's yeah. important information that you've already given us. And we I think that we that try to incorporate it in our curriculum and also in our classes. Right, because we, we tend to think if we come with this, um, with this idea of how we were taught pronunciation when we were training as teachers, right? We tend to think, or teachers tend to think that teaching pronunciation is teaching phonetics. And it isn't. Teaching pronunciation is broader, right? It's, it's teaching discourse, oral discourse, right? And being able to uh, level it or to, to grade it according to our students' levels and according to our students' needs because they, they will not incorporate what they don't need. They will only work with what they want, right? Thinking of their goals, right? Well, I'm very happy and I see there are lots of emails here. So Andres, if you later want to share them with them, uh, with me, Right, so I can thank uh, the audience and perhaps meet again some other time. Why not? Yes, of course, Graciela. So it would be a great uh, opportunity for you, for us to that you came at, uh, you came and as a speaker, no, with a with uh, a second part of the of the topic, or maybe you want to okay. we'll share see. with us another topic. Yes, we we'll see. All right, uh, I'd like to take a. a, a screenshot, right? I don't know if everybody, if some of you are willing to appear on screen or not. Well, if not, just uh, uh, the, right? If you want to appear on screen for the screenshot, that would be great. Thank you. There's one here. I need to go to another. There are lots of people. So, okay. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, those who are there in Ecuador, Peru, I, I think Ukraine, Georgia, I, I read there, Argentina. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Deep no, it was a pleasure for an, an, our immense community. So I want to invite to our new friends, our community, Argentinian teachers. So. Uh, we are so pleased to integrate you in this community for presenting these webinars, these free webinars. So you are so um, pleased to be invited. So for the next um, for the next sessions, that's why we ask you the the emails because we're going to invite you formally. So next Saturday we're going to have another presentation, and um, I think in two Tuesday two two Saturdays we're going to have. Um, more webinars. So I will be inviting you. So, well, Thank to you. finish, my pleasure. To finish this, uh, I want to ask you to be ready for the final picture. So please, teachers, can you uh, open your cameras, please? And we're going to have our last picture, okay? Okay, thank you. So I can see you. Um, I can see Belen, Gonzalo, Natalia, Eusebia, Solange, uh, Noelia. Uh, hello, Miss Julissa. How are you? Okay. Hello, teacher. Thanks a lot for, the, for this invitation. Okay. Are you in Peru, yes? Yes, Lima, Peru. Okay, great, great. Hmm. 
we have some teachers from Peru here. Okay, dear teacher, so we are going to have this uh, picture now. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> okay, crazy picture, thank you. <laughs> thank thank think... you very much, teacher. This is a very nice experience. I like this very much. Uh, I am from Lima, but I live and work in Amazonas, Bawarande, present. Thank you very much. I like this very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you, Miss Josiela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sevilla. Hope to see you next time. And my dear friends, have a nice uh, Saturday and the rest of the week. You know? okay. See you next time. Thanks, Gracia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Good day. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye.